Jonathan's been to many, 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 almost all of the Gradics. Um, and he's here to give us a little bit of a history lesson for maybe some of those people who haven't been to almost every single one. So over to you, Jonathan. All right. All right. Um, can everyone hear me? Is it good in the back? Fantastic. Cool. Um, right. So I'm Jonathan Blanford. As Dave says, I've been to every Guadic but one so far. Um, so uh, I'm very honored to be able to give this history of GNOME talk. Um, just a little bit about me. Um, I run engineering at Endless right now. Um, before that, I had a brief stint running the cloud team at Twitter. And I spent 15 years at Red Hat, five as an engineer and 10 running the desktop team there. Um, I've been st I started working on GNOME in 1997, soon after Miguel announced it. And it's been a huge part of my life ever since then. Um, first as an engineer, and then later as like a board manager or an ad board member, or I guess as a manager too. Um, <coughs> but I've certainly been around and uh, you know, seen a lot of things across the way, and I thought it would be good to try and take a moment to share some of the moments of GNOME and try and tell the story of GNOME. Um, there are a lot of different ways to tell the story. Um, I had a really tough time for me to decide how best to approach it. Uh, I decided to tell it as a timeline, both of the sort of events and the overarching technology. Um, I missed a lot of great stories along the way, and I had to cut a lot of things because there's a lot of history to GNOME. Um, brief may be a bit misleading in this one. Um, but if I told everything, it would be a much longer talk. Uh, so uh, going forward, um, next slide, hopefully. Um, so I love these houses that we've done. Uh, I think it's pretty cool. Um, yeah. Whoever came up with this was, it was a brilliant move. Um, we don't have a lot of time for questions in the middle of this talk, unfortunately. Um, so uh, I'd like to challenge. So who, who's been here for more than 10 or more Guadix? Let us maybe do a quick hold of show of hands. Those are the people you need to talk to to get some great stories uh, for. I challenge those people and everyone else that if I make a mistake in this talk, because there probably will be errors and things like that, uh, please stop me and let me know and correct me, and we'll get the story straight. Um, and that's the way to earn points in this presentation. Um, also, just because this is so cool, uh, I, I know we gave everyone a house names, but I don't think we gave a lot of context to it. You'll see these uh, figures show up a little bit, especially in the early days of GNOME. Uh, but this is Wilbur. Wilbur is the GIMP, oops, too far. Wilbur is the GIMP mascot. Um, to the left of it in purple is Rupert. Rupert was the Zimian monkey and the mascot of Zimian. The goat with five arms is the Geggle, and Wanda the fish is in the lower right corner. And I believe all but uh, the Geggle will show up in these slides. So hopefully you'll notice it as we go through. Um, so before I tell the story of GNOME, I kind of wanted to set the stage a little bit. Um, GNOME didn't come out of nothing. It didn't start in a vacuum. It wasn't just a desktop coming out of Miguel's head. But there's a lot of work that went into uh, the area before that started. And our story really begins with the X Windows system. X was a very early graphical tool s or windowing system. It was created for Unix um, back in 1983, 1984. It was made at MIT in Lincoln Labs. It was made in partnership with HP. Um, it was a, a very early uh, system. And it, why was it called X? Um, for those who don't know, there was a W windowing system that started before it. And this was a successor to it. Um, X is almost 35 years old today. It's kind of amazing. We've been on this long path to replace it with Wayland, but it serviced us very well. Um, and for those who don't know what it looked like, this is what Next Desktop looked like in the early days. Um, this is probably from like 92, 93, so it's after it had matured a bit. Um, but it's interesting to see that you already sort of started seeing some of the features that you might see in a desktop. You had toolkits, you had virtual desktops, you had window managers. We even had Netscape back in the day, uh, amazingly, fairly early on. Um, and indeed, network transparency, which I'll let sit. Um, but the story really begins in, I think, 85. That's when Richard Stallman uh, published his GNU manifesto. Um, this, this, I mean, I think it sort of lost a little bit. Karen gave a great presentation yesterday, so I won't spend a lot of time on it. But this has been an enormously influential doc 
in the computing world in general, in the world in general, and certainly it it's, uh, was part of the GNOME uh, ethos right from the beginning. Um, Richard always talks about the four fundamental freedoms uh, for software. It's the freedom to run, the freedom to study the code, freedom to redistribute code, and the freedom to modify and improve it. He also did a bunch of compilers and tools and, and other things, but uh, the big thing was he put a line in the sand and made a very political statement about what he thought was acceptable for software. And this has been involved with GNOME. You know, we're a GNU project. Uh, there are moments that we've had disagreements and things have been exciting, but for the most part, this core ethos has been part of GNOME since the very beginning. Um, the GNU GPL came out in 1991. It's kind of interesting that there's a six-year gap between when he published his manifesto and when we figured out a way to sort of protect software that uh, he wanted to make as free software. Um, but 91 was an interesting year because in about a three-month period, the GPL, the GNU GPL came out, the initial Linux release came out, um, and those two have been sort of tied, I won't say at the hip, but certainly their successes have built on each other's ever since then. If you haven't seen Linus's original presentation on, uh, or post on what he was doing with Linux, it kind of was interesting at the time, um, but it really took off kind of like wildfire at that moment. There was a very latent need inside universities for a free version of Unix. People had been using Unix on expensive machines. All of a sudden, there was a way to use it on cheap machines. There were a lot of people interested in operating systems at that time. The internet was just starting to take off on universities, and it was a very fertile ground for the free software world to really start taking off. And what we saw is a whole bunch of projects sort of started e one after each other, each targeting a different area of computing, trying to um, you know, bring some, uh, some free software into an area that had a proprietary contender. So the kernel, you had Python, you had languages, SMB for Windows, Apache, et cetera, et cetera. There was a lot of projects. It felt like at the time a lot of projects were being founded almost week after week, and that kind of continued. But during that time, a lot of the big projects really got their start. Distro started to appear. That you know, started in 92. SLS is the first one. The l oldest one right now is Slackware. It's about a two-year period between when um, Linux first got announced and when people started actually trying to bundle it up and distribute it. Most of these are familiar to people here, so I won't go through it, but uh, you know, as distributions started to appear, they sort of started to define what a distribution was, and they sort of all had a very similar uh, look and feel. Um, when they started, a lot of them was very much trying to recreate what people had on Unix. For the most part, that wasn't graphical in nature. It was very much a workstation, um, at least at the beginning. Um, and over time, you know, X was ported to them, and uh, people started talking about using Linux as more than just a Unix replacement. Finally, Windows 95 was released. Um, that was an interesting thing. Um, it changed everything about computing. It's, it's, it's hard to overstate just how influential it was on computing at that time. Today, I think there's sort of a, a sense that Microsoft has peaked, and um, maybe it's true, maybe it's not. But at that moment, it, was, it dominated the industry like nothing before. It took over 98% of the market um, in a couple of years. It pushed out a lot of other people, and they were very scary. They played for keeps. Um, if I had a whole talk on this, we could talk about some of the things that Microsoft did to really change and entrench themselves within the computing industry. And they killed a lot of you know, potential competitors and projects and um, alternatives at that moment. And at some level, they're still uh, uh, coasting on that momentum. And if you were a free software person at that time, or a Unix person at that time, or anyone who wanted to see a competitive market, it felt very oppressive at that moment. Um, they were everywhere. It seemed like there's a long way to go to get between where you know, free software needed to go and where they were in order to sort of reach a mass market. Um, GIMP started in 95. That was uh, started out in Berkeley. 
um, by three hackers, Spencer, Peter, and um, thank you, Josh, Josh McDonald. Um, and uh, it was interesting. It was a first, it was a copy of uh, basically a clone of Photoshop. Like the other big projects, it was, we need a free version of Photoshop at that moment. Um, when they wrote it, they started using Motif, and they started distributing it, and they found it very hard to get people to um, contribute to it, because to have Motif, you need to have a Motif developer's license at that moment, which was very expensive. Only university students had access to it. Um, so what they decided to do is very quickly write a quick clone of Motif. Uh, at that time, it was GTK, which stood for GIMP Toolkit. It was part of the GIMP for the first couple of years. Um, but it was a very active project on IRC. It was sort of one of the flagship projects of the free software world at that moment. And people were very excited about what it could do because it was sort of a moment of pride that, yes, Windows had all this stuff, but we at least were starting to try and compete in some of these areas. So it ended up being a bit of a magnet for engineers to come and start doing things. Uh, there are a lot of different desktops being announced at that time. Um, KDE was one of them. I can think of at least two or three other ones that were announced at that time. Uh, none of them lasted more than a couple of years. Um, but KDE was one that stuck around. Um, I think it was to sort of announce, like, people were announcing projects left and right back then, and they got together and did the first major effort at doing a, a desktop. And they sort of really defined what a desktop was. It wasn't it was something built on top of X. It was a panel. It was a file manager. It was a set of applications. It's what we call a desktop today. Um, I. I, I don't know if it was the first or not, but um, it certainly is the oldest one. It was a great project at the time. I remember running it and being very excited to see s us finally getting our act together and doing something. It was free software on top, but it was based on Qt on the underlying widget toolkit. And Qt at that moment uh, was definitely not free software. It was a proprietary toolkit. It was free for use if you could download it, but it was a lot like Motif in that if you wanted to develop against it, you had to have a developer license. Um, you could, if you're doing free software-based stuff on top of it, you could have an exception for that. But if you wanted to do anything that wasn't free software, you were not allowed to use. Uh, you were had to pay for Qt, and you weren't allowed to make changes to it at that moment. So what we ended up with was this situation where a toolkit, a desktop had finally got together on top of Linux, um, had gotten a certain amount of momentum, a certain amount of traction. Uh, KDE 1 came out after about a year and a half of work, and it was good. It was actually really good. And um, it looked like people were going to coalesce on that desktop. Uh, and those who really cared about software freedom got together and said, this is a problem. How do we convince them to use something other than Qt? Can we convince Trolltech to open up Qt? What's going on? So there's a lot of flame wars going on. And the desktop wars started. Um, so almost 20 years ago, um, Miguel announced the GNOME project. It was August 15, 1997. Um, he, uh, he and I guess uh, Elliot, Lee, and Federico, who's over there in the corner, uh, had got together and said, we can't convince the KDE team to change, or the Qt team to change their license. We can't convince KDE to re, um, rewrite on a different toolkit. Uh, we don't want to be in the business of re-implementing a clone of Qt. Uh, people at the time were cloning toolkits and selling toolkits. It was a weird time in that way. Um, but uh, they said that we're going to do our own project, came up with the GNOME project. They backronymed it to GNU Network. I think it was Elliot who came up with uh, that uh, acronym, and we've been stuck with it ever since. Um, uh, but it, it, uh, he, he announced it, and it sort of went off like a bomb in the Linux community. Um, we end up with a massive fight with people disagreeing with things. Um, we have it was like C versus C++. Yeah, you, you can read it. It, it, it was really the era of flame wars, is how I'd put it, and, and awkward slash dot threads. Um, but um, at some level, this has never completely gone away, but it's certainly changed in, in nature and feeling and 
Um, I think both projects have grown up and matured a lot, so it's not necessarily a thing. But at the time, it really felt like there could only be one, tw one desktop. There wasn't room for two desktops. If one was going to succeed, the other would have to die. And there was this uh, massive fight that occurred between the two. I think that came out of the lessons from Windows 95, um, but it was, um, uh, y y you know, it really felt like uh, only one desktop could be successful. And what happens is it sort of forced people to pick sides, which was unfortunate, but, you know, a, a fact of human nature. Um, so we had people developing their applications either for GNOME or for KDE on GTK or on Qt, and someone would start an application and it would be like G app, and then someone would have to start a K app or a Q app, and uh, there's a lot of reduplication and uh, focus, and the desktops did not work terribly well together. They were both based on X, so you could run KDE apps within GNOME and vice versa. Um, but very much it was a, a, it felt like one size fits all. At that time at Red Hat, um, uh, Red Hat had gotten together, and they're a much smaller company at the time, about 30, 35 people, and they had decided that they wanted to do some development for the Linux uh, ecosystem, and they decided that the other big problem that was going existed was that there wasn't a free browser available. There was Netscape, but that was it, and Netscape was proprietary software. So they got together and they formed a Red Hat Advanced Development Labs, um, started hiring some people for it. Uh, they were going to write a free browser. Then Netscape announced Mozilla and made everything available, and Red Labs kind of existed without a reason. Miguel had picked up on this and convinced Eric Troen and Mark Ewing at Red Hat, maybe it's a good time for you to focus on desktops. Qt is a problem. If Red Hat's ever successful, then you're going to have a problem with having everyone who wants to develop software for it having to pay a third-party company for their toolkit. Um, so they agreed to focus on doing uh, rad, I guess, t on doing desktop development. And uh, this is where I'll insert myself into the story a little bit, but that's where Owen, Federico, myself, Alex, is Alex here? Yeah, Alex remembers that. Uh, Chris Blizzard, he's, he's at Facebook now, was at Mozilla for a long time too. Um, we all got started in trying to really pick up some of the unglamorous parts of building a desktop and really accelerating it forward. And that's where GNOME really got its first sort of big corporate sponsor uh, soon after it started. And this is what it looked like. Um, it's worth pointing out we didn't actually know what we were doing. Um, we, had <laughs> we had some ideas of what a desktop could look like. Um, we knew it had to start applications, and it needed applications, and it needed settings. Um, but we didn't actually know what these should be. Um, so this, was, this is what we ended up doing in the first like nine months of GNOME's existence. Um, I'd like to point out that this is the original Wanda fish here <laughs> in the middle here. You would click on it. I don't know. If, is it my cursor? Yeah, great. It is. Um, you would click on that, and it would pop up Fortune and tell you something. And um, it was kind of charming. It existed. But if you notice, there's already uh, Wanda. There is Wilbur over here as the initial GIMP icon. Um, so yeah, this is what the original GNOME looked like. We'd already done a panel. We started a file manager. We did a control panel. We had some very simple games, some very simple applications. Uh, we'd already started talking about doing internationalization. We'd had the very beginnings of a spreadsheet. Um, true story, Miguel said that he had a, a great plan. He was going to write a spreadsheet in six weeks, and he's going to write a file manager in six weeks. And um, he did something which turned into numeric eventually in about six weeks, and it did display some things. It was, it was kind of impressive at the time. Um, and then he took Midnight Commander and turned it into a, uh, um, a GMC at the time, and it was terrible. Um, words can't describe how bad that was. And he did that in about six weeks, and then Federico and I spent the next six months making it not, <laughs> not crack. So um, anyway, uh, so the desktop wars began. After a while, there's a lot of back pressure on Qt, because they realized that there's a lot of very vocal people saying that um, they were going to, uh, uh, you, you know, drop KDE. KDE was starting to lose momentum. 
Qt was starting to lose business, people were very unhappy about it, so they invented a new license. They called it the, D the QPL. It was kind of GPL-esque, except for at the time everyone's doing their own public license, like the MPL, and I guess that's the only one that still exists. Um, and they relicensed things. In theory, that changed everything. That meant that we could all get together and agree on a desktop. Um, it wasn't ideal in a lot of ways, but it was a lot better than the previous situation. Uh, in practice, people had already picked sides, and people are people. Uh, and uh, it changed nothing. Um, and then later on, Trolltech would fully embrace the, the GPL and make a lot of these concerns go away. I did want to tell a little story, because um, I think this one actually was really important for the early days of GNOME. Um, right after the QPL came out, Red Hat had this moment where they decided, were we going to continue to you know, focus on GNOME, or did we want to switch to KDE? And I sort of feel that at that time, if Red Hat had switched in those early days when we're such a big part um, of the engineering heft there, um, that it probably would have been pretty, pretty dire for GNOME. Um, and the board of directors was kind to come and see what we had done because there was a sense that we'd pushed really hard. We'd made something that looked, well, you saw what it looked like. And um, uh, could we actually make something feasible and functional about it? And we were given about 36 hours to put together a working demo for the GNOME board so that they wouldn't, or sorry, the Red Hat board so that they wouldn't uh, cut the project and switch. So we spent about 36 hours fixing bugs, trying to make things uh, come together. Um, it, it was a really intense period. Um, There's a lot of, uh, well, a lot of, of um, maybe painting over some major cracks uh, that occurred, but we managed to get something together. And we did a great demo. And Ra during that time, Raster had done a new theme and shown the new theming system, and that impressed the heck out of them. So it turned out the actual thing to do was to just make it look kind of cool. Uh, anyway, next era, um, Battle for Dominance and Survival. GNOME 1.0 was released at Linux Expo in 1999. It was barely worked. Um, uh, <laughs> uh, true story. Um, while we're demoing it, we had a moment, uh, that's a different true story, but um, <laughs> while we were there, um, we, we did a demo, and G I mentioned GMC was terrible. Um, that, that I don't say that about a lot of software, but it was. Um, it was not meant to be a graphical file manager at the end of the day. It, it was very, came from different roots. And every time you changed directories, it would seg fault. So that was what happened with GNOME 1.0. Um, so we were, had this on a bunch of machines at Linux Expo and we were demoing it. And we had done two things. We had written GMC, but we'd also just gotten the, uh, um, uh, the session management code working. So what GMC would do is you would double click on a new directory. It would update its internal copy of what directory it was supposed to be. It would then very helpfully let the session manager know that that's where, where the window was supposed to be and um, what directory it was on, then it would promptly crash. Uh, and then the session manager would start a new window in the new working directory where it was <laughs> in the new directory uh, as you would expect. So there'd be this like flicker, it would disappear, then a new window would appear. And we were demoing it pretending like this is the way it was supposed to be. <laughs> Don't mind the slowly growing list of yellow bomb icons appearing on the desktop <laughs> every time that you change directories. So um, we mostly fixed that bug. Um, we also, as I said, we had a terrible press conference where um, we were announcing GNOME 1.0. We hadn't quite figured out how to explain free software to people. And uh, as I said, we had RMS in the audience basically spending a couple minutes chewing down. If you go find this article, it's kind of amazing to go read. Um, but uh, chewing out the, the New York Times for not saying GNU slash Linux instead of <laughs> GNU Linux. And this is a little bit what it looked like. Um, so it was starting to look a little bit more like a reasonable desktop. This is a Red Hat one, but uh, starting to be a thing. Garrett, Garrett did all those icons. Um, and then some, actually no, Tigert did the early ones, but Garrett was very involved with that, so yay, Garrett. Um, we had that lovely embossed background, too. Um, but we had some exciting new people showing up. Um, we had Helix Code. It was originally in, in international GNOME support. Then it was Helix Code, and then later Zimian. Um, and then the chain continues. 
But um, it was founded by Miguel and Nat Friedman. Um, it's very much based on building a desktop on top of GNOME. They wrote Evolution at the time and brought us Bonobo. Um, Easel was started then too. Um, Easel was uh, it's founded by Andy Hertzfeld, uh, who done the Mac Finder for Mac 9 or and even earlier, and had done very well at the early days of Apple, and uh, I guess wanted to do something with it. Um, so we ended up with Nautilus and GNOME VFS out of it. And Sun joined GNOME. Um, is it still up there? Oh, my screen went blank. Um, so Sun joined GNOME. That was kind of exciting for us, too. They were the first major, major company um, to really express interest in GNOME. And what they ended up doing was, um, uh, well, you know, they brought accessibility to the table. So I'm going forward here. Um, and then Guadix started. The first Guadix was in Paris. Um, that was pretty exciting at the time. It was the first time a lot of us got together. Um, it was founded by a guy named Mathieu Lacage. He's had this idea, we're going to do a conference in Paris. We're going to have a user track, and we're going to have a developer's track. Over time, we kind of shed the user's track, unfortunately. But uh, it's continued every year since then. So um, pretty excited that it's been a continuous thing. And it's really tied the project together. We started the GNOME Foundation then, too. Um, we started in a Parisian cafe. We felt like revolutionaries. We had little beanies on. And uh, um, it, was a, it was a good place to do it. Um, we had more companies starting to put interest in uh, the um, GNOME project. It was starting to get maybe a reputation of being a bit more corporate friendly. We, at that point, had gone out and started courting people and saying, hey, we're a safe choice for companies to get involved with. We're doing all these things with other companies. Um, so we got IBM involved. We got HP. We've got Red Hat. As I said, we had Sun. Um, and uh, we're trying to figure out exactly how to bridge the, uh, you know, the um, basically the corporate slash hacker ethos and divide. Because there's very much a, uh, I'd say, a Clash of cultures is the best way of putting it. We had Sun and their ARC process, where every change had to be approved by the Architecture Review Board, and GNOME, where we were pushing out changes all the time. There was very little focus on stability or anything other than just getting something on the screen. And there was very much some clash going on at that time. We also had a lot of discussions about whether or not people were going to get involved uh, as companies, as what. And what we decided then, which actually I think has served us well for a lot of reasons, um, and has served us well during this time, is that companies can get involved with GNOME. They can contribute code. They can join the advisory board. Uh, but individual engineers invol get involved with GNOME as individuals. So if you're a Sun, ha you know, Sun engineer, you weren't a Sun engineer. You were you know, Bill Hanneman, or whoever it happened to be, uh, interfacing with GNOME as an individual. And that's largely been kept to this day. It was kind of new at the time, that approach, because uh, there's a lot more focus on trade groups uh, in the industry then. And not every group is like this, of course. But it's what GNOME chose to do. And I think it was good. Um, and this is what the GNOME Foundation looks like. You'll all hear about it in a, uh, I guess, an hour or so when we start the AGM, or an hour and a half when we start the AGM here from all of these groups. It didn't start with all these subgroups and working committees, but they came out fairly quickly, a lot of these. Um, some have waxed, some have waned, but the overall structure did come fairly well formed and has continued in this way ever since. And this is what it looked like. It was still a little bit crazy. This is a Zimian desktop. Um, it was not pretty, but it was, it was interesting. Um, we added. Uh, um, you know, Gedit started to show up. We added um, sound system. We had eSound. We started. That was our first effort at trying to fix subsystems, actually. Um, and uh, it mostly worked. And I have, I have to stress that it took about two or three years, maybe four years, to get something from something that only, you know, well, my mother didn't love it, but uh, <laughs> only, only, only the hackers could love to something that was really put able to be put on someone's computer. Um, cool. So um, we did this great usability study that Alan posted, uh, talked a little bit about yesterday. 
um, the clock study. This was super revolutionary inside of GNOME. It, before we had reached this point, there was a sense that we're behind, we have a lot to do, we need to add more and more and more and more and more, we need clocks, we need uh, text editors, and there's this kind of this land rush where there's a sense that what we need most of all was a little bit of everything. So, uh, you know, Miguel did his, his spreadsheet in six weeks. That was to try and get something in that space. And we just put a whole bunch of different things out there. And there was no focus on what the overall um, whole looked like. And Sun sort of showed up with this usability study that was terrible. I, ca I, ca I, can't, I can't stress how it felt like as an engineer working at it at the time in the audience to just hear them basically say, your stuff is bad and you should feel bad. Um, and they went through it. And it was kind of a cold bucket of water in the face. Um, and we ended up. Uh, turning the project around. It wasn't overnight. It didn't agree to, not everyone agreed on this path, but enough people sort of took the hint that maybe we should focus on the user. Maybe we should think beyond just cloning what we see in other desktops and take a holistic view on things. And as I said, that's when we started removing features. Um, and we've done nothing but remove features ever since. <laughs> so I'd like to point out that this, in fact, is the high point of all. This is when we had all of our features. And ever since then, we've just removed things. I um, also want to talk about the logos. Um, we settled on the final logo fairly early on in 2002. Um, but there's a sense of people don't know the evolution of this, so I thought I'd just go through it a little bit. Um, the, the GNOME logo got its start from Tigger, who did a great background here of like feet on, I don't know, sand or something like that. Um, and that was our default background when we started. And when someone asked him, he said, oh, it's Gnome's walking along the sand because he didn't want to draw a full Gnome. Uh, and um, we sort of took that footprint and put it on the default start icon almost on a whim. Miguel decided, okay, it's a Gnome footprint. We'll put it there. Um, over time, it, uh, um, you know, we got a, a slightly better versions of that one, but we got into a trademark dispute with a, I think it was like Bigfoot Internet or something like that. Um, where they said we looked too close to their feet. So we took it and we turned it into a bit of a G-shaped foot. And we ended up with this logo. And then over time, it got even more professional. And we ended up with the one that everyone knows today. What's interesting is that over time, sort of the foot has stuck around, but the G, which is there, gets lost. I, um, if you didn't know there was a G hidden inside the logo, you can sort of see where it came from there. But there is a G in there, and uh, now you won't be able to unsee it. Um, <laughs> but that's why the foot looks the way it does. Um, right, so the dot-com bubble burst. It was a bit rough. Um, Evil went out of business. They had a great plan. They were very close to fundraising, and then uh, just like that, things ended. Um, and uh, you know, we'd had people working on our file manager at that point. We had Nautilus starting, and uh, we lost them, unfortunately. Um, Novell also ran into similar problems. They had a happier ending. They were bought by Zimmy, uh, sorry, by Novell. Novell had done, um, uh, what was it, Netware? Am I right? Thank you. Uh, they'd done Netware, and they decided they wanted to get into the Linux space because Netware was an older operating system, and they could see where the future was. So Novell decided that they were going to buy uh, uh, Zimian and try and get into the desktop space. And they did this whole thing. They bought Zimian. They had this discussion about whether they were going to make uh, a desktop based on Debian and you know a better GNOME and try and run with it. Um, what they decided to do, unfortunately, was buy, or I don't know if unfortunate is the right word. It was just a choice that was made. Um, but they bought SUSE instead. SUSE was a German distro at the time and very heavily invested in KDE. I think they had this view of buying Novell, uh, Zimian, and SUSE and combining the two. They'd end up with you know, the union of the two. And what ended up happening was there was, uh, the desktop war sort of continued internally uh, inside of Novell. It was a little tough. And um, unfortunately, I don't think they knew what they're getting into. And the real event that happened in this time was OS X, uh, ten, you know, the very first version of this. Oh, wait, no, sorry. I have another slide here. This is what uh, we, this is as far as we'd gotten is we'd had the file manager Nautilus showing up. We'd had system updaters, and we'd actually started doing uh, system-wide settings. So GConf was an early technology back in 2001. 
Um, it's since been replaced a bunch of times, but that sort of ability to do instant applies was starting to show up, you know, even 15, 16 years ago. And this is what actually happened, is OS X 10 was released. And uh, at the time, it felt like the two Linux desktops were going to be Windows and Linux, and there's a real sense that we sort of had not time, but if there was a need for another alternate desktop, it was probably going to be Linux. Microsoft certainly looked at it that way. Um, but this, uh, in the reality, OS X and Apple was good enough that they started to eat into the free software world, and we started to run into some more problems. Um, but we didn't know this initially. So GNOME 2 was released. GNOME 2 was released in early 2002. Yeah, that's Seth Nickel. Um, he's a great guy. He was the designer for GNOME 2. Um, very stand-up guy. Uh, and Je Jeff Waugh. Jeff Waugh was the release manager for it. Um, GNOME 2 was a complete rethinking of things. It was our first effort at going into design and usability. Um, it was completely controversial. Users hated it. Um, rejected by a bunch of different users. Uh, what ended up happening is that uh, we rethought the desktop, we really tried to make things a lot simpler, and it was the first effort at doing things in a, um, you know, a, uh, with usability in mind. And this is what it looked like. It's starting to look a lot cleaner uh, over time. This is starting to look a bit more professional, too. Um, it had Ante Ellis text. I can't tell you what a revelation that was to uh, the Linux world at that moment. We had our first effort at Pango and internationalization. GTK2 was released. It had sort of major widgets. It wasn't a motif clone anymore. Um, we had real theming. We had Dbus. Um, and we had uh, GStreamer. GStreamer started there. We could do a total talk on the history of GStreamer, but uh, that's, I think, most of the knowledge will be. Um, and we actually, one other thing that was fairly revolutionary at the time beyond just uh, the uh, feature set and the focus on usability is the focus on time-based releases. Um, this was something that was new. Um, it was something that uh, was inspired a little bit by the way that Red Hat was doing things at the time. Uh, Jeff sort of took that idea, but Jeff really sort of hammered it home that we were going to go with a release every six months, uh, and that's the way we've kept it. And the basic idea is to focus on releasing and making the release reliable and predictable and have features slip rather than the reverse. Before that, we were very feature driven and very feature heavy in our releases that made sort of coordinating things almost impossible. And that was a huge release of pressure from what you were doing. It had accessibility. This was kind of exciting. Um, certainly this idea of universal access is something that's really important to me personally, but the project too. Um, it mean, meant that we're very explicitly designing a desktop for more than just ourselves and to more than just uh, Linux geeks. Um, we were sort of moving in that direction, but bringing accessibility into it really forced us to face that. Um, there were some grumblings at the initial of it. The initial implementation of it was a little rough. Um, there was a real push to get it in time, uh, done to hit a certain deadline, and we rushed some things, but. Uh, all in all, I'm really glad that we did that. Havoc said this. He doesn't remember he's saying it, but I very much remember it. We also had this idea of uh, really focusing on sort of simplicity and taking uh, hard choices away from the users and going with good defaults. Havoc said, let's turn settings into preferences. Um, what's a setting? What's a preference? Kind of sound like the same thing. At the time, what he meant was a setting is something you could get wrong while a preference was something that just didn't matter. So things like your net mask is a setting. Things like your background is a preference. Things like your routing table, which you used to be able to configure, or you know, um, any of your computer uh, hardware-related stuff are settings, while things that just affect the way you interact with your computer are preferences. So we started this fairly long uh, path of trying to only present choices to the user that matter and trying to really focus on um, having things that are, uh, you know, only asking the user for input when they really care, because most users don't care about it. 
Um, and then along the same line, we start talking about just works. That was the original, like, I think, GNOME 2.4 release thing, was it just works. We started using dbus to try and drain the swamp and really go lower in the stack. Started writing kits and then managers and then, you know, whatever it ended up being at the end of the day. Um, but there was the first effort of sort of GNOME people saying, to do this, we need more uh, support from the kernel than we currently have. We can't just allow root passwords and text file configuration. We really need to manage the system. And this ended up being a fairly influential uh, change to Linux's ecosystem, too, even on the server side as well. Um, I just wanted to mention Stateless Manage Linux. This was a project that we started in um, 2004, and it looks very much like uh, Atomic, uh, I guess, Ato Atomic Workstation that Fedora is talking about, and uh, Endless is based on this model in CoreOS as well. Um, it was something that we sort of came together about 15 years ago and said that what we want to do is make all the hardware sort of auto-detected, have the operating system be sort of read-only and apps be separate bundles. This model was even sort of proposed back then. We did it with a bunch of shell scripts and it, was, it didn't really work all that well. And we realized we needed to fix a lot of the system, um, certainly at Red Hat, in order to make this model work. And a lot of the next decade of Red Hat sort of focus on that desktop team was on trying to fix uh, the hardware to make that kind of model work. And it's really paid dividends for the project over this time. And this is what GNOME 2.8 looked like. It was starting to kick in. This is what the GNOME 2 experience really, what I think of, started to look like. Um, we had uh, the panel at the bottom. We decided on one default panel. The GNOME 1 days, you could move the panel wherever. You could have drawers. You could do have drawers and drawers and drawers. It was kind of silly. Um, but we started to pick a default setup and started to impose that on uh, our users. Um, you know, we ended up with a working Nautilus. We ended up with working network uh, power management and suspend and resume. Uh, it took me years to get over sort of the nightmare of shutting my laptop lid and not knowing what's going to happen when I reopened it. So if you haven't used, if you didn't use Linux in those days, uh, uh, be grateful because you never knew what you'd find. Um, and then Ubuntu showed up. I think that that was genuinely exciting. Um, they were sort of at the right place at the right time, and they took Debian, GNOME, and the kernel and said, we're going to focus on expanding the audience. At that point, GNOME was really talking to the free software world and to Unix people and to computer people primarily. And they were the first people to really show up and say, hey, what about the rest of the world? Let's start trying to get beyond our traditional market. Um, and they put together a great product that had an easy to use installer, they had a great sort of um, way of distributing it, and um, it, it had a it had an effect of bringing a whole lot of new users into Linux and a whole lot of new users onto GNOME. Um, and it felt a little bit at that point like even though we we're losing a lot of people to Apple at that moment, we're starting to turn that around a little bit by getting other users, and um, you know things start to turn around. Um, the 2005 hit, um, Nokia showed up. Nokia had um, been working sort of on a skunkworks project on the side for a while. Um, what they were going to do was um, take GNOME technologies and turn it into a tablet. They had come up with the idea of an internet tablet. Um, and they showed up and they came to Guadic in um, Villanova, I believe. And they basically said that we want to see a bunch of GNOME uh, technology show up. We don't hire a lot of people. We tend to work through contractors. So there was a mad scramble for a bunch of different uh, engineers at that point to start forming uh, consulting companies based around GNOME, all trying to make uh, Nokia, uh, you know, Nokia products work. This was a um, this was really kind of cool, um, and a lot of those pro companies, you know, are still around today. Not all of them, but a lot of them got their start in this initial push. And this really changed the GNOME ecosystem. We ended up with a lot more um, uh, y you know, companies as a result, uh, or people working on it. Uh, Intel did the same thing. Um, it got a bit confusing, but they started a, uh, a mobile project, which was their attempt at trying to create a desktop based around, um, I guess it was Netflix, Nick's here somewhere, he can tell you all about it. Um, but uh, 
they were very much focused on taking sort of the GNOME stack, turning it into a um, viable sort of internet tablet uh, slash netbook. They did a lot of work on that as well. After a while, they sort of got together with Nokia and said, hey, we've got doing something very similar here. Why don't we join forces? Um, uh, Red Hat expanded the desktop team. This is, a, again, a personal one, but Red Hat decided that they need to get more involved with desktop two as well. The team had been very small prior to then compared to other things that were going on, and we ended up expanding the team fairly uh, substantially. And as part of that, um, you know, one laptop per child got started too. Um, that was another GNOME-based project. Um, it was Sugar, Sugar was a GNOME-derived product, so it wasn't exactly the GNOME experience. Um, but it, uh, I'd say it was a very successful project. Um, it really sort of drove the market down on devices and showed that there was interest and demand in both educational uh, computing and in um, computing in outside of in developing worlds. And then also, um, it sort of sparked the netbook craze um, at that time. Uh, I'd say that OLPC did not manage to take the most advantage of you know, the market dynamics that they spawned, unfortunately. Um, they're a bit too ambitious and a bit too aggressive, and I think they, they annoyed a few too many entrenched uh, people to be successful. But, oops, too far. But this is, uh, is going to be by 2006. We ended up with webcams working. We had, um, you know, printing was starting to work. That was something that's amazing. Well, mostly works. Um, <laughs> Uh, not on Tuesdays, <laughs> but we're better than OS. Uh, we're better than Macs right now. Um, and then um, it, we we started to try and get rid of the root dialog everywhere. At this point, prior to this, you'd have people requiring you to type the root password, and you have to explain what an administrator was, and all this awful code that kind of made it all work. Um, and we started to rip that out. Um, and then I guess Nokia bought. Trolltech, um, they, uh, they ended up having a big internal battle, very similar to Novell's, between GTK and Qt. It was two different departments. The one working on the internet tablet, um, they weren't allowed to put a, a cell sim in their device because that was a different group internally. So they had this internal politics going on. Um, it caused a big delay. Uh, the, the iPhone came out. There was a lot of panic inside of Nokia. They said, okay, well, we can still do something here. Then Android came out, and uh, I think that was pretty much it for them. Um, which brings us to the next phase. This is kind of, I think, the darkest time in GNOME for me, because um, it was pretty tough times at some level. Um, so first thing, as I said, Nokia sort of turned into a pumpkin. Um, <laughs> there's sort of the clock ran out on them. Uh, they, they, you know, they were trying very hard to, um, uh, you know, find a niche, but they couldn't, and they withdrew completely from, you know, this ecosystem altogether. Um, yeah, this is GNOME 2.28. Uh, we started talking about chat, fingerprint support, smart card support. Um, just to highlight a couple things, you'll notice sort of a trend of more and more hardware. Uh, um, types showing up. Um, but inside GNOME, outside of the Nokia situation, things still seemed okay. Um, but we felt like things were stagnant. If you'll notice, the last couple rounds of screenshots all looked very similar. We weren't changing. I'm going to need more time. But, uh, <laughs> um, you know, we were starting to um, think about what GNOME 3 was going to have to look like. Um, and we started really trying to think about, let's take a step back. We've had the same appearance for six years. Let's rethink what the desktop could look like. Um, yeah, OK, so I'm getting a bit of have myself here. So as I said, we got together. We had a lot of plans about what GNOME 3 could be. We did a lot of proposals, a lot of designs. Um, unfortunately, at that moment, Mark decided that he wanted to go a different path with Canonical and had decided that they had a very different strategy, which involved them sort of owning a lot of the IP for the stack. And we ended up having a fairly large, uh, very public split at that point when they came out and said, we're going to do Unity instead of GNOME. They'd sort of taken 
GNOME up this point to, you know, they'd written GNOME this point and then decided that they were going in a different direction. I think a lot of people were around for, um, uh, or a lot more people in the room were around for this time. Um, and it wasn't a lot of fun, um, I'll be honest with you. It felt very sad to see the, the two communities split. It was not what we wanted to do. When we started GNOME 3 planning, we very much, very intentionally tried to pull Canonical and Red Hat and SUSE and everyone else into the mix to make sure that everyone had a voice in the table as we did these designs. Um, but we weren't able to make that work. Still, GNOME 3 was released. Um, it was a massive accomplishment. I really have to say that this is probably the biggest thing that we did as a project. A lot of effort, a lot of time, a lot of heartache went into doing it. Um, it's completely controversial. Like GNOME 2, rejected by many existing users. Um, you're sensing a theme here. Um, but this is what it looked like. And it's a lot cleaner. And this is very much recognizable as the desktop that we have today. We lost this cool feature here, unfortunately, as chat turned into closed gardens. Um, I really like that launch feature. But this is very much recognizably the initial GNOME 3 list. It was released uh, six years ago, and huge amount of functionality had been done in the GNOME 2 days that got pushed out to GNOME 3.0. Um, so it was a monumental thing. And um, I'd say the desktop world fragmented. Um, I, you know. There's a lot of people who said, I'm not using GNOME anymore. I'm going to start uh, go to well, different places. Um, there was a big sorting that occurred. Uh, new desktop showed up like Mate, like Cinnamon, like Elementary, et cetera. Uh, Unity very clearly was one. Uh, and I don't think that we ended up with any one winner as a result of this. Um, I think it was just a lot of effort and noise. And it's, it's kind of a sad thing. And uh, this is another view of it. So moving on. Uh, after 3.0 was done, we started turning the crank again. We went back to time-based releases. Very slowly, very surely started focusing on, well, let's go back to fundamentals. Let's see what we can do. And there's a pretty steady focus on really improving uh, the interface and fixing some of the worst things that happened. Uh, 3.2 was released, and that had the first go at extensions. Um, I sort of look at that as kind of a, a pressure release, as in, if people had specific needs, we were able to start accommodating for them in new ways. It gave us a way to experiment with new designs and new functionality. Um, I don't know if it was ultimately fully successful, but it, uh, uh, at that time, it made a huge difference and I think stemmed a lot of the bleeding. Um, also, Alan, where's Alan? Thank you. Um, did fantastic work, and John as well, on actually sort of tweaking a lot of the worst problems that we had with the initial three release. Um, some of our user base actually got used to the change. There was a pretty big shock when we went from two to three, but there were very compelling reasons to move to the new system. And over time, we found that people got used, not just used to it, but actually liked the new workflow better. We did fix some very big problems with GNOME 2 as a result of this. We started routing applications. A lot of applications were written in this time. It was, a, I think, a new look for GNOME. Previously, we sort of had the thought of applications as something we needed, but they weren't really done with the project in mind, and they weren't done in a way that really made them consistent. Um, and I think, you know, this is, this is really sort of uh, borne a lot of fruits over time. And then you can see, uh, uh, you know, as the app started showing up, uh, it started getting a lot more attractive. Um, and something weird happened. Um, this is the weirdest thing. Um, we got in this little fight with a company called Groupon, which I'm sure you remembered. Um, that, that was kind of nice, actually. That was very good for my morale when it was all was said and done. Um, Groupon, for those who don't know this story, um, I, a lot of people here probably do, but Groupon had come out with an internet sales tablet that they called the GNOME tablet. Um, and then they filed for 29 trademarks on the word GNOME and tried to strong arm the GNOME Foundation into giving up its trademark or at least letting them go out with this tablet. And we were very, uh, we weren't willing to do this without a fight and spent nine months in negotiation with them trying to get them to agree to um, change the name of their tablet. Um, 
negotiations broke down, so in desperation, the GNOME Foundation said, hey, we need to go hire some real lawyers to go to court, and we need money for this. We don't have the money for it. Can people, uh, you know, can we be doing a fundraiser to, to try and raise money for it? And we didn't know what was going to happen when we did this. Um, the board was very much not sure that they're going to get any sort of uh, funds at all. Um, and what happened in three days, we raised uh, over $100,000 in legal fees. Groupon got such bad press that two days after we did this, they cried uncle and were trying to negotiate a way to get out of the situation and agreed to completely change the uh, terms of it. And it, it felt very good. Um, I think a lot of people realized that GNOME had sort of been in part of the, the um, the infrastructure and was just sort of there. And then when we were actually faced with some real problems, a lot of people rallied and came to our aid. Um, a personal note, um, Rosanna, I guess she has her phone. And every time we got a donation on PayPal at that moment, it would bing, like make a little noise. And we did this post and then had g just gone to bed and her phone started buzzing and then buzzing and then buzzing and then buzzing and buzzing. And it was just kind of the most amazing thing just to hear the phone just ring nonstop as people started <laughs> putting in uh, donations. Um, and uh, it, yeah, it was cool. So then that brings us to today. I spread up a little bit um, to talk, a, uh, go a bit faster, but um, here's where we are today. Um, I just want to take a very brief moment to sort of call out two things that are happening now that I think are pretty exciting. Uh, Flatpak and Flathub, that's been the talk of last Squadic and this Squadic. Um, yeah, it's cool stuff. Um, Flatify things, I guess. I don't, I don't know what the right uh, verb for this is, but I really hope it gets the adoption it needs. And actually, on, on a personal note, I really think that um, uh, Flatpak has the possibility to really take GNOME beyond sort of its current niche and expand. We've always had a problem of having direct access to users. The project has always had to go through distributors or y you know, tablet makers or um, other distributions. We've always had a miss between it. Um, and um, uh, this is a chance to maybe do differently than that. And then finally, the other big exciting thing is Ubuntu Return Queues uh, GNOME again. I can't overstate how excited I am about this one. This is a, a chance to sort of heal a major division, division that we've had and you know, heal some wounds and get some focus. And I'm very excited about our ability to um, you know, move forward uh, as a wider community and really take, um, you know, uh, maybe consolidate a bit more. So I had some final thoughts. I'm out of time, as Dave keeps doing, so you'll have to listen to me uh, later. But just really quickly, um, I, I just want to say three things rather than a lot. Uh, when we got started, I didn't realize how hard this was going to be. Um, basically, the bar kept moving. And doing this uh, presentation really drove that home. Uh, we've totally beaten Windows 95. That's awesome. <laughs> Yay, guys. Uh, But people's expectations got bigger and bigger and bigger every year, and we're always scrambling to keep up. Second big observation I had is we've done a hell of a lot of great work here. Um, we mostly kept up with the bar. There's some moments we fell behind, some moments we got ahead, but we always kept a compelling and a useful desktop in the era we lived in. And um, I'm very impressed at what people have done. And my take is I think the future is brighter for GNOME than it's ever been. I really feel very good about the project today. I think I see a lot of momentum, a lot of consolidation, a lot of agreement on what needs to be done, a continued focus on fixing a lot of the hard problems, and that just makes me feel really excited about the project. Um, just I want to say thanks to Federico, Owen, Robin, and Rosanna for helping with this presentation. Special Federico, he, he helped me come up with a lot of things that I had forgotten. Um, but most of all, I want to thank everyone as part of GNOME <laughs> who <laughs> who has contributed to, to the project. I just tell the story here. Everyone else had to actually make the code, do the icons, make the design, documentation, promote it, all the things that makes the project successful. I'm out of time, I think.
i'll take any questions after the talk if we're done.